I'll be trying to complete the DLC while only using pot and jar related items. If you haven't seen the original video, I recommend giving it a watch just to see how my current build develops. A reminder of the rules for the run. I will use any item that is pot or jar themed. This includes armor, weapons, and items. I'm not counting perfume bottles in the list of items, but flask will be included. The list of the main options I'm allowed are as follows. Cracked pots, ritual pots, hefty pots, the jar cannons, and the jar summons. Also, before anyone mentions it, I understand that Mimic Tier would technically still be allowed. Since I'm only using pot items, it technically would be as well. But I think that takes away from the unique build since you can kind of apply that logic to any build and always have Mimic up. Next, I am only allowed to do damage with my pot related items. This means if I run out of throwing pots and my jar cannon is out of shots, I'm not allowed to start punching a boss. And lastly, the goal is to defeat the final boss of the DLC. With everything summed up, we can get into the run. Loading back into this old save, I realized I had not beaten Moog yet. It had been a while since I played this build, so I went in without recording to see what kind of damage I could do. I accidentally almost beat him first try, so I had to throw the fight so I could start the fight over and actually record this time. After summoning Jarrite, I start taking shots with the cannon at his head. I try to get in as many shots as I can while my summon is still up, since he can take some aggro. The Jar Cannon is probably the slowest weapon in the game, so I don't get to use it very often when I'm by myself. The summon did get a nice Frostbite proc, which allowed my bolts to really start chunking his health. The second phase is where I start to use my throwing pots. During this phase is when my summon dies, but luckily he had Poison Moog. Poison wears off about one fourth of his health left, and I use a combination of Frost Pots and Swarm Pots to cause Frostbite and Bleed. With the last Blood Loss proc, I can start the DLC. When I get to the Land of Shadow, the first mission I have is to get strong. There are many items that are available to you before fighting a single boss. The first item I can grab from the Scorch Ruins is a Hefty Cracked Pot. These are the new upgraded pots from the DLC and they will be a total of 10 we can get. Then I go around picking up a bunch of the Shadow Tree Fragments. I don't get any sort of scaling from the Jar Cannon, so I'm going to need this if I want to do some good damage. I also only have a pot on my head, so the damage reduction from the Blessings is necessary. Side note if you weren't aware, but make sure to defeat the shadow enemies that are sparkling with pots on their heads. These guys usually drop either a Shadow Tree Fragment or a Revered Spirit Ash. Speaking of Revered Spirit Ashes, I made sure to grab a bunch of those as well. I rely on my Jarrite Summon to try to take some aggro, so I need him to be as tanky as possible. I was at Shadow Tree Blessing 5 and Spirit Ash Blessing 4 as I challenged the Dancing Lion. My first attempt was really good. I got him down to about his name. The second attempt was even better. Not much thought went into the setup for this boss since I was kind of testing out the damage I could do, but I went in with 16 Volcano Pots, 8 Frost Pots, 1 Swarm Pot, and 3 Poison Pots. The idea was to mainly rely on the Volcano and the Frost Pots. The Swarm and Poison Pots were there to assist my summon. You see, the summon will throw a variety of pots, including Poison and Swarm Pots. If he happens to land one of those pots, I could also throw one of mine to hopefully proc that hemorrhage or poison status. My summon ends up dying as I throw a few scuffed frost pots that don't land. Luckily, I still have a lot of volcano pots, though I end up missing a couple throws and run out of pots except for a couple poison pots. However, the boss was already poisoned once, so I don't think the two pots that I would have would be enough to proc it again. So it was time for the old trusty jar cannon. <laughs> Second try. After Dancing Lion, I pretty much run past everything and went straight for Rilana. The initial setup was a mixture of Volcano, Frost, Swarm, and Poison Pots. My first attempt was pretty similar to Dancing Lion. Got her to about her name. At this time I was running out of materials, so I needed to go farming again. And this is a part of the build that I don't miss and prefer to do most of this stuff when I'm not recording. If I have too many tries on a boss, that means I need to spend more and more materials to create more pots. After farming, I tried a couple times, but it didn't go too well, so I went back to farming. 
Had a couple more deaths, bringing the total up to 5, but I was getting better. I did nail down the strat I wanted to use, and it was using only frost and swarm pots. My summon and I start off by causing frostbite. He also gets a nice poison proc on the boss as well. She plays nice for a bit by standing in one spot, allowing the two of us to get some big damage in with the swarm pots. Whenever frost falls off of her, I try to reapply it again since my summon likes to throw fire pots at her, removing the frostbite. Even though she is weak to bleeding, the swarm pots can be a bit difficult to pull off. They are most effective when the target is pretty much in one spot. Relana does have a few moments where she is more or less stationary, but she also has moments where she's dashing around the arena. If I throw a pot at an unlucky time, she will most likely just dash out of the AoE into an attack of her own. The best time to chuck a bunch of these pots is during her phase transition. And with this run I got super lucky, being able to proc not only hemorrhage, but my summon got another poison off. I have to do a lot of running and dodging in this phase because I'm trying to bait her into an attack where she is mostly still. She gets distracted by my dying summon, which is another great time to throw some more. When she goes up to her twin moon attack, the poison stops ticking, but once she's out of it, it continues to tick again, which is pretty nice. Honestly almost sold at the very end, but was able to recover and end it with a frost pot. It was time for me to gather some more new items. I start by heading to the river so I can obtain a somewhat secret item. If you ever find these pots hanging down from ropes, they can be destroyed to drop some key items. Two of these can be found at both ends of the river, and they will make this run a lot easier. You see, these are the Mushroom Seller's Bell Bearings, and they'll allow me to buy Toxic, Red Flesh, White Flesh, and Regular Mushrooms from the Twin Maiden Husk back to the round table. This means I don't have to spend nearly as much time farming for materials to make a lot of my pots. I continue grabbing some more cookbooks. Some enemies are blocking the way to a few of my items, but of course the Lord of Pots will deal with them honorably. <gasps> I make sure to grab my new helmet, which also increases the power of my thrown pots. At this point, I only had like one new crack pot, so I needed to gather up some more, along with even more cookbooks and a bunch more fragments. I didn't want to get too far ahead in the blessing level, so after getting to blessing level 10, I went and fought the Golden Hippo. I only died to this boss three times, but I still hate this boss. I have noticed I get a lot angry at a boss if they seem like a spaz to me. This usually means the animal-like bosses, anything that just flails their body around hoping to crash into something. Anyways, the pots I decided to go into the fight with were 8 frost, 19 swarm, 1 poison, and 6 hefty fire pots. The swarm pots are a lot easier to land on this guy. Since he is so big, even if his attacks make him move, a uh, part of him is usually still in the swarm area. The hippo does have some pretty quick follow-up attacks, and if I'm stuck in the throwing animation, I can say goodbye to like half my health. So I try to only throw pots on his longest recoveries. Hippo gets to half health when my summon dies, so now is when I have to be really cautious of when I'm throwing these things. I was able to get another frost proc. I tried to get a bleed one, but ended up running out of swarm pots. I am glad that I didn't though because I was able to end the fight with a new one. I brought out the hefty fire pot. After Hippo I grabbed some revered spirit ashes and the rest of my sacred tears since until now I hadn't even realized I wasn't at max. I was only at plus 8. Guess that's all I needed during the base game. It was also time for me to grab the new jar cannon. In Rabbit's Rise I can find Rabbit's cannon, which is a new cannon that deals split damage in physical and magic. It's not as strong as a normal jar cannon, but this one has a different perk in the form of guided bolts. For example, if I try to shoot these flying bats with the normal cannon, the bolt is going to miss. But with Rabbit's cannon, the bolts curve toward the target. This should definitely come in handy for any sort of like boss or enemy that ends up moving around a lot. I wanted the Shadow Tree Fragment in Jagged Peak and the Ancient Dragon Man was blocking my way. This fight was super easy. If I find myself fighting an NPC enemy, I opt for the cannon instead of my throwing pots. And this is because they usually get knocked down from the bolts if they are in the middle of an attack. I can get very easy shots in whenever the boss is distracted by Jar White. If the boss starts approaching me, I prepare my shot and hold it until he starts the attack animation. Then I can fire the cannon knocking him down. Rinse and repeat until the boss is dead. After grabbing the fragment in Jagged Peak, I went back to progress Shadow Keep. 
Besides picking up more fragments and ashes, there's not really anything important to say in these sections, since I'm pretty much just running past all the enemies to progress the area. Once I reached Mesmer, I did have a fair share of practice runs. One of them was pretty goofy. I died, but he took some damage afterwards, so the cutscene still played. And after it finished, it looked like I lost the fight because Mesmer showed me his Abyssal Serpent. After about an hour of attempts, I devised my strat and I just needed to execute it. At the start of the fight, he slams down at your location, so I primed his landing spot with a swarm pot. Immediately afterwards, I get hit by the explosion and then a spear throw, so the execution is already not going well. Once I recovered, I needed to continue the blood loss buildup. Mesmer's assault was a good punish window for me. I continued to focus mainly on using my swarm pots. Mesmer's orb is another perfect window to get some more bleed going since he has a decently long recovery time. Eventually as he gets closer to half health, I bring out the freezing pots to try to get him to that next phase, but it's not quite enough damage. While Atari does frostbitten, they take extra damage from physical attacks, so when he goes for another assault it allows me to get some big damage in with a hefty rock pot. I then push him into the next phase with a cannon shot. The second phase is when I call in help from my summon. I continue to try a lot of swarm pots, but throughout my attempts I notice something really nice about the second phase, and it's that he is extremely weak to frost in the second phase. During the first phase it would take two pots to cause frostbite, but for the second phase I was able to get two single pot procs in a row. While he's distracted by my summon, I get to lid of the ground in more swarm pots and get more blood loss. I then followed up with another single frost pot proc. I could be wrong, but I think Mesmer and his snake either had separate status buildups, or when he transformed he would lose his current condition. The snake looks frostbit, and then Mesmer changes back and he doesn't have the visible frostbite status. I knew I could get another proc. One pot didn't do it this time. And I almost sold another fight because the pots were getting thrown past him, but luckily my last pot makes contact and it finishes the fight. Another round of fragment foraging after Mesmer was defeated. The next boss on the list was the Shadow Tree Avatar. Because of the last few bosses I fought, I was specting the Arcane for Bleed Pots. So I respected the Strength and Dex to make full use of Fire Pots. I went into the fight with 16 Volcano, 8 Freezing, and 4 Hefty Fire Pots. Also had a couple random pots, but they weren't used. The idea for this fight was to stay close to the boss's front and bait out the Head Slam attacks. Since I'm mainly using Volcano Pots, I want the boss's head to stay in the lingering radius for as long as possible, and the head slams gave me exactly what I wanted. Decided it was best to wait till the second phase to summon. I used the same tactics I did in phase 1 while mixing in some freezing and hefty fire pots. And the hefty fire pots did insane damage. I really should have just had a max number of those, since one pot to the head was about 4000 damage. Then I start phase 3. Normally you perform a critical attack on the boss to change phases, but it's not necessary. Since I'm only using pots in the cannon, it's not even possible for me to perform that attack. The only difference when the boss comes back is it will be at full health again instead of it already being down 25% after the critical. The large AoE attack kind of sucks to deal with, but it does give me a wide damage window after the boss uses it. After expending the rest of my volcano pots, the boss uses its ultimate attack. Overall, fight was not difficult. The boss's extreme weakness to fire helps out a lot. The next boss I wanted to fight was Commander Gaius. However, I felt that with how garbage the fight is, I would need to get stronger. The last fragments I can get are after the Commander, in the last area of the game, and the Abyssal Woods. In order to access the woods, I needed to get past Jory. Jory was a bit more annoying than expected. It's dangerous to use my Jar Cannon because of the golden arcs he sends out. The arcs don't stagger or stun me out of my reloading animation. This means if he uses the attack after I shoot him, I'll end up eating all the attacks while I'm trying to reload. I still end up using it because this boss is in water and I have lightning great bolts. This boss is mostly stationary so I opt for volcano pots. It only took a few cannon shots and a couple volcano pots to get this boss's health down to half. My summon did help out by poisoning Jory. The best move the boss used was Spyra, but specifically when he used it on my summon. Jory just stands there defenseless, allowing me to stack Volcano Pots. In one cast I was able to do almost 7000 damage, and it would have probably ended the fight had he not teleported away. But then things got scary. I tried connecting another pot, but he teleported again. Got to his new position, and his big body summon pulls a get down Mr. President. 
I really wanted to end it and I got punished hard. Again, the golden arcs don't stun me out of the animations, so I just stand there eating them and almost end up dying. Lived with probably like 11 HP. After I recovered, I responded with a shot he couldn't avoid. Now that the woods were open, I could grab the fragments and the ashes I wanted. Commander Gaius was probably one of my favorite fights for this challenge. Not because the fight is good, no 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 no. This fight is still awful and the hitboxes are questionable. It's one of my favorites because I felt like I truly learned the fight and figured out how to abuse spacing in my own hurt box in order to get damage off. I learned quickly that the jar cannon was not going to be viable. Even when I waited for commander to be aggroed on my summon, it wasn't enough. He would just target me and I couldn't finish the reload in time before getting hit with the charge. And of course it's awful trying to roll through the charge attack. Since I probably needed to light roll and the cannon wasn't really of use, I decided to unequip it and my shield. It was going to be an only pot fight. I went in with 18 Volcano, 8 Freezing, and 2 Hefty Rock Pots. I summoned right after walking through the fog wall. And the idea was to freeze him right away and then throw my Rock Pots while my boss was distracted by my summon. The first one hit, but the second one just barely skimmed past him. I have more than enough Hefty Pot containers to make more than the two that I was bringing in, but the farming I had been doing with all the attempts was taking a toll and I just didn't want to get up to the 10 max pots every single time I fought him. My summon nicely proc poison for me before dying. Now it was time to switch to my volcano pots, and this is where I created my strategy. The idea was to get right by the boar's ass and get him to attempt a kick. I can roll away from it, but the best thing for me to do was just walk backwards to avoid it. Then I would unlock and throw a volcano pot down at the boar's back left leg. Now why was I doing this? Well after the missed back kick, there are a few things the boss would do. The boar could stretch upward and then sort of belly flop down. This would keep him in the burning area. He could also run away, but he didn't do that too often. The main reason I did it was because of the flailing attack he does. Sometimes the boar will act like a raging bull. Now when he does this, he always does it to the left. So if I throw the pot at his back left leg beforehand, the boar will still be in the radius of the burning area even after he flails around. This is why I enjoyed the fight. Figuring out the perfect spacing and maximizing damage while minimizing risk felt great. Also with all my practice runs, I was able to learn how to dodge the long combo he can do. If you don't know, here's what you should do. Roll left once and then roll right three times. This helped me consistently avoid getting caught in this long combo. At this point I felt like I wasn't taking advantage of the new pots as much as I could be. So I made sure to go around and pick up the rest of the available cookbooks. The next boss I wanted to fight was Romina, and she was incredibly easy. I think it only took two tries. I went in with 6 freezing, 18 volcano, 5 hefty volcano, and 2 hefty freezing pots. Romina is weak to both fire and frost, so I opened with a freezing pot that instantly procs the status effect. The reason it's been hard for me to use the hefty pots isn't because they're bad, they're actually really good. It's because they take so long to throw. I usually either need a distraction or to hit trade in order to get the hefty ones off. Either that or I'm just bad, which is partially true. There are definitely attacks that do give me a long enough punish window, I just think sometimes I'm a little bit impatient. I continue chucking volcano pots at her, and when she starts her second phase, I can get in an explosive bolt. The rest of the fight was more frostbite and more volcano pots. Of course though, I had to finish the fight with a cannon shot. Afterwards, I went to pick up one of the most important items for this run. And this hanging pot is another bell bearing, and this bell bearing allows me to purchase fly mold instead of needing to farm it from the fly men. This ingredient is essential for hefty swarm and rot pots. Another boss that was surprisingly not too bad was Midra. I'm going to this boss with 6 holy, 10 swarm, 8 freezing, 3 hefty swarm, 1 hefty freezing, and finally 3 hefty rot pots. Starting the fight just involves some cannon shots. I need 2 rot pots to start the damage over time. I had a third as extra in case I missed one. Next, Jar White and I combo some freezing pots. Then I just start chucking hefty swarm pots. My summon dies pretty quickly, but the boss is also dying fast. Blood loss does big damage, and the entire time the rot has been ticking away. I follow this with even more swarm pots for a big blood loss chunk. Two freezing pots and a hefty one for the last frostbite. This is the time where Mace likes to throw. I was taking a lot of hits trying to finish the fight. 
couple holy pots, some swarm, and some freezing ones that don't proc anything. Always takes me missing some pots at the end to remember that my trusty rabbit cannon was by my side all along. I was excited for the next boss because I was going to use some pots that I had never touched. First I needed to respec. Opted for a heavy dex and faith build. I was going to use holy and lightning pots for the next boss which was putrescent knight. He was not a difficult boss though I did have a classic throw. I had two healing flasks but I was stubborn and wanted to beat him. I tried finishing it with a holy pot but couldn't get the toss off in time leaving him one hit away. On the successful attempt I went in with two hefty rot pots, 17 holy, 8 red lightning and 2 hefty red lightning pots. He starts far away from the drop so I can summon Jar White, shoot a lightning bolt and throw a hefty rot pot with enough time to dodge the first attack. The red lightning pots seem to have a larger AoE so it made it easier to hit the boss. I wouldn't say the body of this boss is small but it was really hard to hit sometimes so that's why they were nice. Then I start using a lot of holy pots. Putrescent Knight is extremely weak to holy damage and one pot was doing like 1000 damage. It did not take long to burn through his health. It was best to unlock and aim at his horse when I could, because the instant I locked on I started missing. Once that was handled I immediately went to the next boss, but before I could fight it I needed to get rid of a pesky NPC invader. Nothing some rot and cannon fire can't fix. Materia also only took two tries and I didn't fight long in the first try. For this one I had two hefty rot pots, four red lightning, six holy, and thirteen swarm pots. This is probably the boss I got the most damage in while distracted. It only took 20 seconds to get the health from full to half. For a lot of these fights you'll notice that I don't bring all the pots that I could have. This is more for limiting myself. I felt like if I went in with max I would end up using a bunch of the pots that have more difficult materials to farm. Instead I would practice with the bosses with easier to make pots and spend practice time throwing those. This boss didn't give me too much practice time since it was so weak. There are still a couple of moves I'm not entirely sure how to dodge. I throw some swarm pots at the ground anticipating the landing but I judge the distance terribly. And that's alright, she was low enough. Before going on to the hardest DLC fights I'm going to quickly go over where I spent most of my time farming. First for hefty rot pots I needed scarlet buds. The area outside Romina's boss room was my preferred location to grab a few. For hefty fire pots I needed black pyrefly and that could be grabbed near the bridge to castle Ensis. Need to jump off the cliff to ensure speedy farming for this one. For hefty rock pots I needed round rock which could be quickly gathered outside the entrance to Rivermouth cave. Hefty freezing pots need frozen maggots and I was able to gather a few in belly rat jail. This farm also needed me to jump to my doom. The hefty fly pots need sanguine amaryllis. Starting at the ancient ruins base side of Grace, I can make my way to a nearby cave and pick up a few materials on the way, in the cave, and on my way out. Both red lightning pots need red fulgur bloom. At the foot of Jagged Peak, I can run past the fighting dragons, and after going up a couple spirit springs, I can find a bunch of them. Lastly, for hefty volcano pots, they need gas stones, which I can get from the ruined forge lava intake. This one's a bit more annoying because I don't get a lot and I have to wait for the enemies to send me back to the grace. I was coming up on some of the most difficult bosses so I decided now was when I could max out my blessings. Before finishing the main part of the DLC, there was one more side DLC boss I needed to fight, and that was Bale. Curse you, Bale! I hereby vow you will rue this day! Behold, a true great warrior, and I, Egon! Your fears made flesh. I fought this guy for over 2 hours, but I think I could have ended it early had I not been forcing the cannon. But it seemed like a great opportunity. The cannon does pierce damage which is the only thing that Bale is weak to. So for most of the first phase I was sticking with the cannon since my summon allowed me a decoy. It also allowed the tracking bolts to really shine. The lock on is Bale's head which is where he takes the most damage. Even though he is big bodied he moves his head around a lot. If I was using the normal jar cannon then I would most likely either hit his body doing half the damage or I would miss him completely. 
This was the sloppiest run as well. I had completely run out of healing flasks by the time the second phase started. Before the second phase, I started to pepper him with a few swarm pots. This way I could proc blood loss quickly after the phase transition. This is when I took a gamble with the hefty rot pots and got lucky. When I started to throw them, he used a big attack and I just tanked it while connecting three rot pots to proc the status. I still only had my health regen for healing at this point, so I really needed to focus on dodging and letting the rot do its work. But of course that's boring. So I went back in with some hefty fly pots. Probably had the luckiest dodge here. At this point, Bale was getting predicted and I had the perfect opportunity for a couple more fly pots. Angled crotch cam to finish the fight. I was on my way to finishing the DLC. I met Leda and started the NPC fight, and immediately I realized I messed up. Part of me didn't completely think that the NPC fight was a required one. This is only my second playthrough of the DLC, and I never really tried to run past before. I had to fight Hornscent, Moore, Dryleaf Dane, and Leda. I was in for a terrible time. My first idea, of course, was using Jar White as my summon and focusing on the cannon. Cannon's what I've used for all the other NPC fights up to this point. It's really good for knocking the NPCs down. The problem here is the amount of enemies. I can usually keep one at bay, but not any more than that. On top of that, Moore only needs to hit me with a single rot pot to proc the status. I needed to focus Horn Scent down because if he happened to look at my summon while he had his orbs up, my summon would lose half its HP. I could usually take out Horn Scent without much issue, but the more Dry Leaf and Leta combo was so much to deal with. I was trying to use some hefty fly pots and volcano pots. It was hard to keep them in the damage area, and even when I did, the damage felt weak. More was a huge wall for me. At one point I threw like 4 hefty rot pots at him and it never worked. He has so much health and I don't think normal damage pots would work since I have to deal with a heal from him as well. I then try to fight numbers with numbers. I switched to the soul jars of fortune ashes as well as an NPC summon. I was getting desperate. It didn't take long for me though to see that the pot ashes were still as terrible as I remember them. They weren't doing anything. Switched back to jar white along with the NPC summon and it still was not enough. After replenishing my materials, I decided I was going to need Mimic Tear. I know what I said at the beginning of the run, but it's still not breaking any rule. I just thought it messed with the fun. Mimic has more health and can use my Jar Cannon as well. I started to change the pots I went in with, focusing on some Hefty Freezing and the Cursed Blood Pot. This pot makes my summon attack a specific enemy with more ferocity, but it still wasn't enough. Even relying on Mimic, summoning Ansbach, and using specialized pots, I wasn't able to get it down to just fighting one NPC. After all the attempts, the best I had done was me against two. I was spent. I had died so many times without making much progress. It seemed out of reach. I broke and resorted to summoning outside help. I needed to summon actual people with stronger builds to fight these guys. Four was just too many and I couldn't go back and change my questline decisions. After going through like 10 sets of multiplayer helpers, I finally got a squad that was able to help me take down the NPCs. It felt good to finally be done with this fight, but only for a moment. I felt like I failed. With all my previous challenge runs, I haven't broken the rules or the theme of the run, but this time it felt like I did. I really wasn't able to progress this fight with my pot and jar themed items only. The next day I had gone to work and discussed my struggle with some co-workers, and during this conversation I had remembered madness pots. I hadn't used them at all this run because they really only work on NPC type enemies. It might have made the fight easier, but I don't know. It was too late. I had beaten the fight, and it's not like I had a save backed up that I could revert to. I felt dumb for not thinking of those earlier, but what was I supposed to do? I'll tell you what I did. I got my ass back in there. I grabbed a save for the Nexus which had all the items but none of the DLC completed. I loaded it up and ran through the entire DLC again grabbing all the hefty pots and cookbooks I needed. I made sure to progress the quest correctly, preventing more and horn scent from showing up in the end. I got all the way back to the NPC fight for another round. They weren't going to best me this time. I was coming out of the fight only using my pot themed items. This time I only had to deal with dry leaf and letta. I continued to use Mimic Tear and added new pots to my list. I was going to fight them with Madness Pots, Cursed Blood Pots, Rot Pots, and Albinuric Pots. The Albinuric Pots prevent healing for 30 seconds. For the small pots, I made them all Rope Pots. This is because I'm consistently being chased, so they allow me to keep walking and throw them behind me. For some stupid reason, the NPCs still dodge, but I'm still more likely to hit them this way than stopping and throwing them at their face. I cursed Dryleaf for the start and focused on causing Rot. The next goal was to proc Madness. It might work on NPCs, but it still takes a ton of hits to make it work. 
I was absolutely blasting Dry Leaf with the Hefty Pots. Eventually took him out with the Rope Madness Pot. Next was on Taletta, and she hit me with the most ridiculous jump dodge I've ever seen. WHAT THE FUCK IS THAT?! This input reading bullshit had me going crazy. I wasn't able to rot her, so I put the old cannon back on. It was gonna take a lot of shots to take her down. I had to be patient. She could delete my health bar instantly if I missed at the wrong time and get stuck in a reloading animation. My normal strat of waiting for the enemy to start an attack animation was dangerous as well because of her move where she summons a bunch of light darts. The darts don't stop just because she gets staggered. Mimic let me know it was my story, not his, and after his death I was able to end it. I felt much better about this end. It was in fact possible to do, I just needed to set myself up better for the fight. It was finally time to complete the run. I had a lot of practice for Rudan and figured out how I was going to beat him. I needed a light roll so I put my cannon away and just kept the shield. The loadout was 5 hefty fly, 18 swarm, 4 hefty rot, 8 freezing, and 1 furnace pot. Focus was to always have rot up. It only takes one hefty pot to proc. I was almost always able to safely get one off right after his first gravity attack. From here the focus changes to causing frostbite. If I wasn't quick enough it took 3 to proc the status. From here anything extra was just to speed up the process. The rod itself was enough to push him to the second phase. Then it was time for my favorite strat that I devised. I needed to get off rod again and the T-pose was my best option. I needed to connect two. I immediately threw them and used my physic flask which had the opaline bubble tier to tank the nuke beam. It was perfect timing every time. With a second rot proc and barely any damage taken, it was time for me to summon in Jar White. Similar to the first phase, the focus is freezing first and then switching to bleed. Two hefty fly pots do insane damage. When it goes up for the meteor attack, Radon is still taking tick damage. I chuck a couple of fly pots from downtown when he nukes my summon. I wish I had thrown a furnace pot instead for a cool finish. Bleed doesn't proc and I end up messing up my rolls. But I wasn't going out alone. Not the flashy finish I was hoping for, but at least it was still kind of cool having us die together in frame. With that, the Lord of Pots had defeated a god. If you found this video interesting or enjoyable, I have some other videos on my channel you might like. 